Hello and welcome to an environmentally friendly edition of Stu Does America. Seeing that we've all been devoting 100% of our attention to not dying of COVID for the past year, I thought it was important to remember some of the issues that have fallen out of focus. One of those being media and politician fueled climate change alarmism. Now the worst of the coronavirus is over. We're going to see Biden and his pals trying to funnel as much money as humanly possible into their multiple green scams. And guess what? Unless we fight, unless we get informed, unless we vote, they're going to get away with it. And we know that. So tonight, a reminder to think for yourself from some of my favorite people, author and journalist Matt Ridley from the UK, reformed climate change alarmist Michael Schellenberger, and the skeptical environmentalist Bjorn Lomborg. And before we go, please take a moment today and honor the earth by lighting a giant pile of styrofoam on fire and make sure you do it in your own hometown. Remember, think globally, act locally. Last May, right in the middle of the pandemic surge, British author Matt Ridley published a book that was absolutely perfect for the times, How Innovation Works and Why It Flourishes in Freedom. Innovation is a critically important idea, especially with the Trump administration doing everything it could to kickstart a vaccine solution for COVID-19. I talked to Matt how, uh, about how freedom-based innovation could and ultimately would uh, find a vaccine and create one quickly and efficiently. We're seeing all that now. We also hit on the innovative fight from our history to take to the skies and other great American successes. That's America, the story of constant innovation, including the very first American innovation to ditch the king. So who would be better to tell that story and many others than my favorite British dude, Matt Ridley. Innovation clearly is our way out of this and going forward needs to occur to make sure the next one doesn't happen as well. You go into uh, one of the, one of the uh, topics that you talk about in how innovation works uh, our vaccines um, and how they developed. And uh, you write something uh, and, I, and observe something that you come back to often in the book. Uh, you write in, in how innovation works. Vaccination exemplifies a common feature of innovation that use precedes understanding. And I think that is totally the reverse of the way people understand how these things come to be. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think this is really interesting because uh, it, it, uh, at the moment we kind of assume that you have to start with science uh, and then you gradually um, uh, implement it and the result is that you eventually end up with, with technology that is applied. Whereas in the case of vaccines, it's quite clearly the opposite. Back in the 18th century, you have people coming back from the Ottoman Empire, from Constantinople, um, Lady Mary Pierpoint in the case of the UK, uh, other people in the case of the US, saying, hang on, they've got a habit over there of actually deliberately giving smallpox to kids from somebody who's recovered a very small dose uh, and that makes them incapable of catching the disease and dying from it later in in life and um she was lady mary was a proselytizer for this really dangerous and weird habit then she was criticized heavily for it and the guy who tried to invent invent uh, introduce it in in boston had to end up in hiding because the mob was trying to kill him for this dangerous idea. Um, and it's not until 200 years later, beginning with people like Pasteur, that we begin to understand how it works. And we still only half understand how it works. We understand that it stimulates the immune system into producing antibodies. Um, but innovation, sorry, vaccination is something that uh, we've been inventing for two or three hundred years it saved millions of lives probably billions of lives and we've and we've done that without necessarily understanding why or how uh, which i think is rather rather wonderful and it implies that we can change the world bef before we understand it quite often science follows uh technology so another example is uh, thermodynamics followed the steam engine uh, rather than the other way around Mm. Yeah, I mean, could you go into a, a, a lot of that in the book? And I think it's it's an interesting approach because it's not something that I would have intuitively thought of. Um, you, you go into this as well when it comes to flight, um, where, you know, and this branches off into also you talk about the government and their involvement in this, which I think is a fascinating thing, particularly to this audience who looks at government skeptically, and I think uh, <laughs> in a very uh, real way. Um, Let's go to the Wright brothers versus Langley, 
This is such a fascinating story because everybody knows the story of the Wright brothers. I think at least they think they do. You, you told it in a very interesting way. But when you put it on the other side, side by side with what Langley went through at the same time, it really paints an interesting story. Yeah, yeah. December 1903, two different groups try to get a powered airplane into the sky at the same time. Uh, one is run by this guy, Samuel Langley, who's head of the Smithsonian Institution. He's an astronomer. He's he's a grandee. Uh, he's a great uh, uh, respected scientist. Uh, and he goes off into a, uh, a closed locked room and comes draws an idea for an airplane and he doesn't talk to very many people he keeps his project secret he gets a huge grant from the government uh, very large in in the context of the time and he builds a machine from scratch without testing the elements of it you know he puts it all together uh, and he launches it from the top of a houseboat in the potomac and it goes up into the air a little bit and then collapses about 20, 30 feet from the boat into the water and breaks up. Uh, and the pilot is okay. He's got a life jacket on, which kind of implies that he knew that <laughs> this wasn't going to work. <laughs> and he swims to the shore. Um, and the government is so humiliated by this uh, failure, because there's a huge crowd watching, that they they never support uh, flight again. They, they regard it as a crank idea. Just 10 days later, on a barrier island off North Carolina, two bicycle mechanics from Dayton, Ohio, uh, genuinely do get airborne with powered flight for the first time, famously, of course, the Wright brothers, um, and nobody believes them. It takes them several years to uh, get taken seriously, um, and it's not really till they go to France and fly around in circles for an hour on end uh, that people realize that, that, that they've done it. Now, what have the Wright brothers done right that the that Langley did wrong, they put together the elements gradually for this. They they tested gliders, they tested how to steer a glider in the air, they tested the exact shape of the wing in, in wind tunnels to, to how to get the, the right lift. Um, they corresponded with lots of different people, people who built gliders and other uh, devices to try and understand things. So they, they were, they're drawing on a network of expertise and they're putting things together gradually and collectively. And they leave the the easiest bit to last, which is designing the engine to go on board. Um, they've, they've, by then, they've done several years of experiments. So they do trial and error. And that's what good innovators do, is they use a lot of trial and error. They don't try and invent the whole thing at once. They don't try and figure it out from first principles. They just do lots of experiments. Uh, so the Wright brothers are a very nice example of how to do innovation, and they stand in sharp contrast. And by the way, they then ask the U.S. government for some money to develop this, and they're told to get lost because the U.S. <laughs> government's been burned by uh, Samuel Langley and doesn't want to go near it. Yeah, it's an amazing story. I mean, and it, it, it so plays into the the way government is. And you have a bunch of good examples. I would say the R100 and the R101 that you tell in the story as well is another great example. I would encourage people to find, um, you know, it's funny you say trial and error. And I've said we've all said that phrase a million times. And it wasn't until I was listening uh, and reading uh, your book, which I did a little bit of both. Um, it, it had uh, the word it, it never mentioned success. I never I never really internalized that before. Trial and error never says you win. It just says you yeah. lose. That's how <laughs> central failure is to that process, isn't it? Absolutely. And 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 great innovators get that. I mean, Thomas Edison went on and on about this. He said, I haven't found, uh, I haven't failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work. Um, <laughs> Jeff Bezos take, talks about this a lot. He talks about you've got to keep swinging and missing. Um, in order to get to the point where you swing and hit. Um, uh, uh, you know, the, the important thing is to try, try something. Uh, and if it fails, fine. And if you look at the history of Amazon as a business, it's a string of pretty disastrous failures <laughs> until it's a huge success. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it, it bet on a lot of wrong businesses in the in the dot-com boom of the 90s. Mm -hmm. Most of them went bust. It tried to get into toy retailing and, and it didn't manage it. Uh, it. It did all sorts of ventures which didn't work, but it learned from the experience and it, it gradually uh, improved. And I asked Jeff Bezos once uh, about how he keeps a big company innovative. And he said, one of the secrets is to get ideas from the bottom of the business reaching the top of the business. And the way to do that is to make sure they don't get vetoed because a big business very soon becomes conservative and uh, rejects maverick ideas. And so he has a system whereby uh, if there's an idea presented to a, a level, layer of management, if uh, all but one people in the room say it's a bad idea, 
then they can't veto it. It has to go up and be heard by a high level of management. So he's hearing the minority view from within his organization. And I think that's quite an interesting way of thinking about it. I want to go to um, a theme that Matt brings up often in the book, and I'm torn as to whether be excited about it or depressed by it. Uh, He writes, innovation in computers was and is not really a story of heroic inventors making sudden breakthroughs, but an incremental, inexorable, inevitable progression. Uh, The myth of the lonely inventor, the solitary genius is hard to shake. The individual is strangely dispensable. Uh, Matt, don't take my hero story away from me. I want to believe that at some point in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to come up with this idea that cures all the world's ills and make billions and billions of dollars and have fame and fortune. But you're saying that's not really how innovation works. No, I'm afraid it isn't. Um, Again, when you look at the details of an innovation like the computer, you find it's a much more collective experience. It's, it's, It's lots of different people. It's impossible to say who the inventor of the computer is once you look at it in detail. There's lots of different people contributing lots of different ideas. And it's not just that, but as I say, there's something inevitable uh, about technology. So if you think about the search engine in the 1990s, once the internet was built, it was inevitable that people would develop search engines. You didn't need um, Google to be invented before you could have search engines. And it's the same in the 1870s with the light bulb. 21 different people came up with the idea of the light bulb independently. There was Edison in America, obviously, but the Swan in England and Lodigan in Russia and a whole bunch of other people. And they all got very cross with each other and said, hang on, that's my idea. But all that was telling you really was that the idea was ripe. The technologies that you needed to combine to make a light bulb, electricity, glass, vacuums, uh, that kind of thing, uh, were we had all reached the stage where it was sort of inevitable that people would put that together. And therefore, if Thomas Edison gets run over by a tram, we still get light bulbs. But the weird thing about that is that Nobody predicts the light bulb coming, and nobody really predicts the search engine coming in the 1990s, curiously. When you look forwards, you don't see the inevitability of these things. Um, Now, that's not to detract from the talent of some of these people. Uh, You know, Thomas Edison in particular is is a fantastic innovator, partly because he understands the importance of trial and error. He tried 5,000 different types of plant Mm. before he settled on Japanese bamboo to be the filament of his first light bulb. Uh, So he knew the importance of just trying and trying and trying till you got it right. Um, uh, But, and, and also, here's an interesting thought. Shakespeare didn't have to worry about somebody else writing his plays, whereas Thomas Edison did have to worry about somebody else inventing his light bulb. So in a way, it's even more clever, the person who gets there first when it's a competition. Yeah, yeah, you kind of mentioned this. And in a way, it's a compliment. Um, It was really fascinating to read how often, though, number one, we can't even trace back to who actually thought of these ideas. And number two, how often different people around the world, sometimes close to each other with no knowledge of each other, were able to kind of come across these same ideas at almost the exact same time. Uh, You know, it, it is you mentioned that it's right because those things are available. But is there, it almost feels like there's something more to it where, I, I don't know, I mean, you know, there's, there's plenty of cosmic ways to, I guess, to, to explain it. But is there, is, there a, a, is there a foundational sort of like solid way to understand why these things all happen at the same time from people who aren't talking to each other in most cases? Well, occasionally you find that it's 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 not coincidence. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's they're snooping on each other. <laughs> so Alexander Graham Bell and Elisha Gray applied for a patent on the telephone on the very same afternoon. You know, they both visited the same patent office, and you think that's an amazing coincidence. But when you look into it, you find that they were well aware of each other, <laughs> and they were fran- frantically racing to get ready in time to be the guy who who files the patent. But no, uh, I mean it, it is spooky sometimes. But there's nothing uh, supernatural about it. It's just the fact that technology usually consists of combining existing technologies in in new and interesting ways. And um, uh, it just so happens that at certain points it becomes obvious and inevitable that you will combine certain technologies and produce uh, uh, interesting outcomes uh, and other people do it. And it occurs to pretty well every technology that there are rivals. Um, And of course, it's not just people arriving at the same idea at the same time. It's also 
uh, people building on the ideas of their predecessors and then having their successors build upon their ideas. So I give the example in the book of uh, Norman Borlaug, the uh, guy from Minnesota mm. who went to Mexico and developed uh, dwarf uh, wheat varieties that he then uh, persuaded India and Pakistan to take up, which had an incredible impact on world hunger, basically abolished famine. Uh, and, you, and he got the Nobel Peace Prize and quite rightly, he was a, you know, a truly significant figure. But actually, when you look at it, where did he get the idea of dwarf wheat varieties? He got it from a guy called Burton Bales, who he met at a conference in Buenos Aires, who told him that he'd heard of a guy in Orville called Orville Vogel in Oregon who was growing these dwarf wheats that would yield much more uh, for the same inputs. And Orville Vogel had got it from a guy called Cecil Salmon, who went to Japan on General MacArthur's staff, and he came across this agricultural research station in Japan where they were growing these dwarf wheat varieties and these had been developed and crossed and hybridized by a guy called Gonjiro Inazuka who uh, in the 1910s and 1920s and where did he get it? We don't know, but you know he he won't be the end of the chain. Right. Um, you know it. it so so uh, singling out one person and giving them the Nobel Prize or a patent is sometimes a mistake. It's tough to admit when you're wrong. It's even tougher to acknowledge that your being in the wrong contributed to a larger problem. But people of intelligence and character will take what they've learned to be true and use it as their basis of information moving forward. This is exactly what happened with author and self-described former climate change alarmist Michael Schellenberger. Luckily, Mike has gone through an awakening. We talked about the increasingly harmful effects of climate change alarmism and how easy it is to actually debunk the widely held scientific beliefs if you actually take a couple of minutes to look at the research. He's an incredibly important voice for these times. He's Michael Schellenberger. I've followed your work for a, a long time now, and I, I've always I've considered you one of the more important people in this debate because you're able to actually uh, approach it from a side of understanding um, I think uh, that that many 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 don't have. Um, you you tweeted this today though. I, th I found it interesting. You say on behalf of environmentalists, I apologize for the climate scare. The climate change is real, but it's not the end of the world. It's not even our most important environmental problem. I am delivering my apology in the form of a book. I hope you accept it. What are you apologizing for, Michael? Well, I played a role in scaring people. Um, uh, I don't think I was as bad as some people, but I certainly framed climate change as an existential crisis. I su suggested that it was, um, you know, a threat to human civilization and humankind. Um, it's really not, um, at least nothing scientific could be said like that. And I became very concerned last year in part because I have a 14 year old daughter and she's fine because I explained the science to her, but her friends are very scared. A lot of adolescents around the world felt like they wouldn't grow up to be able to have kids. They, uh, you know, girls were crying in London. Um, mm -hmm. One out of five British children have nightmares. And this is wrong. And it's not, climate change is not the end of the world. Um, in fact, the news on climate change has been getting better because it appears as though uh, we're reducing emissions much faster. I mean, most people don't know that most rich countries have been reducing their emissions for several decades. The United States have been re reducing its emissions for almost 15 years. So there's just a lot, you know, we've been reducing the number of deaths from natural disasters for 100 years by 90%. So there's just a lot of good news that people should know. There's a lot of challenges as well, but I wouldn't consider really any of the biggest challenges to be climate change. Uh, certainly not now, um, but probably not even in the past. Well, the book is is great. It's a great read. It's one of those I know I'm going to be going back to over and over and over again. To I remember this stat on this page. Thank you. Um, it, it does a great job explaining uh, everything. Um, I, I want to make sure that the people understand who you are, because it, it, first of all, the book is not a polemic by any means. It's not it, you're not some conservative activist who is working for Exxon Mobil. You tell people a little bit about your history, not just your activism recently, but also going back to when you were a teenager. Well, sure. The the first I started, I was an environmental activist from the age of 16. I threw a fundraiser for Rainforest Action Network that year. Uh, so that was 33 years ago. Um, I've worked on a lot of different causes. I've helped save, uh, helped save California's last ancient redwoods, um, helped blow the whistle on factory conditions in Asia, operated by Nike. I've worked on, I advocated a big renewables investment that President Obama made. I helped to make that happen, $90 billion. I've been a, uh, I've worked for everybody from Earth First to Sierra Club um, to NRDC. So 
I really care about this. This is my life's work. I have my mission has always been focused on both lifting people out of poverty and protecting the natural environment. And it's on that issue that I part company with some of my more alarmist colleagues who have used climate alarmism to deprive poor country the energy they need to develop, used it here to moralize on things that really don't matter very much environmentally while opposing the things that actually are important for protecting the natural environment. So I wanted to, this is a long time coming. This is uh, not a, this is not a book that I'm going to, I'm not going to, I don't write books every year. This is only my second book in 15 years. So there's a lot in here, a lot of stories, a lot of stories about what life is like for the billions of people who don't have access to modern energy. So I want to bring that sensitivity in because I just think we get very lost in our first world problems. Yeah. And we don't, we don't, we forget the fact that we're actually some of the most fortunate people on earth. Yeah. Yeah. And you make a great case that both of these things actually can be done at the same time and people can benefit as well as the environment. I want to start right where you start, which is you talk about a, a group, um, uh, ex- ex- Extinction Rebellion, and they, they, they're kind of a theme throughout the book. You bring them up often. Uh, they are, I don't know, you'd see that like the crazy climate activists who bring in coffins into the streets and in the most um, flamboyant way possible. And you talk about them blocking traffic in, uh, I think it was London. And it was an interesting perspective you had on it as as the media members questioned this group over and over again, they would say they would agree with their claims, but at the same time criticize things like blocking traffic. When you put those two together, it really doesn't make much sense, does it? Right. I mean, if you think that billions of people are going to die, or even if you think that just millions of people are going to die, then, then blocking traffic seems like the least you could do. Like, why, <laughs> why would you stop there? I mean, it's quite, I mean, we laugh, but it's, it's got some disturbing overtones. Um, you know, I think there's sort of a sense by a lot of journalists, I mean, I have to say I was surprised. I mean, I've, this, I, I started criticizing the alarmism last year. The most common question I got from journalists, I won't name any names, but some prominent ones, was, hey, isn't some exaggeration necessary Mm. to get people's attention? Here's the problem with that. First of all, they've been exaggerating this for 30 years, so you can't have it both ways. You can't say that nothing's been done for 30 years, um, (laughs) and we haven't been alarmist. We've been alarmist for 30 years. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's another problem with it, is that when you start escalating these claims so that you go, you know, millions, billions, it starts to lead you to justifying some, I think, some pretty reprehensible behaviors, particularly redirecting World Bank money away from things that lift people out of poverty to things like democracy workshops, charitable activities that are not critical to economic growth. There's a lot of environmentalists that are just against economic growth. I think they forgot that we all became very wealthy, secure, prosperous, free people. You know, a lot of environmentalists are, are, are feminists, women's rights advocates, gay rights advocates. There are no women's rights in a society that's really poor. Mm. You know, there are they're not rights for minorities, racial or sexual minorities in poor societies. So the characters in my book are mostly women. They're often uh, women of color, uh, poor people. So this is not a this is not a right wing book. This is not a book that lets liberals off the hook. It says if you really believe in in you know what you might call humanistic values, values that put people first, then you can't justify many of the behaviors that climate alarmists have been perpetrating for the last three decades. Yeah, I mean, just the, the journey of Bernadette and Suparti in the book, are it's a fascinating uh, way to illustrate how this affects real people. Um, I want to I want to hit quickly. Uh, you blew my mind a couple of times right near the beginning of the book where this sort of thing played out. A quote, a, a claim from environmentalists that I've heard a million times. I've seen quoted and parroted by media sources a million times. You yeah. uh, take that claim and you go to the scientist who is responsible for the claim, and multiple times they tell you, actually, that was a misquote. I didn't even say that. I mean, that is an absolutely fascinating uh, thing that happens at least two or three times right near the beginning of the book. How did, I mean, I, that was an incredible thing to go through. Did you expect to hear we're talking about misquotes? Yeah, I mean, there's some pretty bad behavior here. I mean, I, so, so, you know, I wrote this book in the simplest way possible because I wanted my my 14-year-old daughter to read it. Um, I wanted kids to be able to read it. 
Because, you know, look, if they have to choose between, you know, an old guy like me and Greta Thunberg, they choose Greta Thunberg. <laughs> so I felt like, well, I got I got to put the data together and I'm going to go interview because Greta Thunberg says, listen to the scientists. Mm. Well, she's listening to basically three or four apocalyptic, radical left scientists. I interviewed them. And I'll tell you the thing that was really um, disappointing about those conversations is how quickly each of them attempted to blame journalists mm. for having misquoted them. It was almost like an intuitive response, you know, and one of them, one of the claims was, I don't see how the planet could sustain a half billion people. Okay. There's seven and a half billion people right now. The, the quote was, I don't see how the world could sustain a half billion people. Well, the, the scientists who I interviewed, said, oh, I was misquoted. What I said was, I don't see how the earth could sustain half as many people. Well, it's still claiming that <laughs> billions of people are going to die. Why are you even, it just got to the point of being so pseudoscientific. And so, yeah, I did actually get to the bottom of the really um, hysterical claims, but there's other ones. I mean, th this idea that, that the, the Brazilian Amazon rainforest is the lungs of the world it was never true. <laughs> it has been debunked since the 60s, it turns out. Um, it was debunked, actually, when I was a kid in the 80s. Um, and in fact, in the early readers of this book, I debunked it too quickly. The readers said they just couldn't get over it. So I added this very long paragraph. I thought it was boring about how the oxygen respiration cycle works. Um, and it just shows, I think, I mean, by the way, it's, 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 New York Times, CNN, it's mainstream media that said the Amazon is the lungs of the world. It, first of all, it doesn't make any sense because the lungs, of course, <laughs> absorb oxygen and emit carbon. Right. The Amazon absorbs carbon. So, but that, that kind of stuff is shockingly common. I mean, I'm not really, I don't know other issues like healthcare or, or all the other issues that we debate. But in this case, it's really almost the case that everything people think about the environment is wrong. We've been misinformed. Yeah, and it was it was really interesting, um, and I think you have a, a real advantage over any other book I've read, uh, you know, that has any 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 uh, relation to the topic that you're talking about here. In that, these scientists took you seriously. I think a lot of times, you know, when you come out with something critical towards science, they they reflexively uh, bring it back to partisanship or you're anti-science or whatever it is. All these, you could tell that you, they respected you. They took you seriously and they tried to answer your claims. At least that was the impression I got from the book. Um, and over and over again, you brought them, you put them in places that I think made them uncomfortable. But instead of the reflexive answer of your anti-science, they can't really pull that off with you. Did you f feel that like that was an, uh, uh, an advantage as far as trying to get to the truth on this stuff? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, you know, I mean, the, the, the only reason I never did this earlier is that I always thought that somebody in the scientific community would do this work and they, they kept not doing it, you know, and I got an invitation from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change last year to be an invited um, expert reviewer of their reports. I'm, I'm very sure that that came from people inside IPCC who think, who understand that they have a problem of credibility mm. because of all the alarmist messages they put out over the years. So, you know, I mean, I think, you know, look, people are willing to talk to you if you're, you know, I'm a, I am read a column for Forbes and, you know, I usually call these guys and, you know, and I mean, I think that the thing I'll say about the book is that um, there's, there's, I always try to um, bring out the best in everybody I interviewed. And so, you know, one of the people I actually really liked was this woman who's famous for having pulled the plastic straw out of the sea yeah. turtle nose. Mm -hmm. It's this viral video. You know, she and I got on the phone. We were on the phone together for an hour and a half. And um, I really respect her and what she's doing. And I respect her marine biology work. At the end of it, though, we had an argument about she she thinks that private companies like Coca-Cola should be responsible for recycling activities in poor countries. I think that Mostly, we're going to deal with waste problems in the way that we've always done with it, which is that there's a centralized waste repository system. But I wanted to bring that into the book, which is to sort of say, hey, you know, there's actually a lot of good people working on this. Some people have some ideas that aren't quite right, but I, it's certainly not a book where um, I was trying to kind of just find, you know, the bad part of people. I always was looking for both the good and the bad. One of the biggest problems with our out of control media these days is that people believe it whether it's that Donald Trump made America hate Asian people or that man-made climate change will set all of our puppies on fire in three months. The media reports bombastic falsehoods 
as the truth and regularly. Luckily, we have people like Bjorn Lomborg. He's the author and president of the Copenhagen Consensus Center. He's here to remind us that while there are aspects of climate change that may require rational action at some point, it is far from the biggest problem affecting humanity right now. A much larger problem for all of us is our inability to look at the truth. It's been interesting doing this show in the middle of a global pandemic. Books take a long time to write and no one predicted to release their book in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, so how do you, I mean, when you look at this with this new perspective of the crazy world we're in, what can you take from the book that applies to today? Well, I think there's a couple of things. First of all, people have more time, so they actually like to read more books. <laughs> uh, but I think uh, the, the pandemic has taught us, I think, two very important things. One is there's a real cost to over worrying about global warming. So if you look at what the WHO did over the last 10 years, they have more and more focused towards saying global warming is the biggest single issue, even for health, which is by pretty much all standards, just simply silly. Mm. But it of course also means that when a, an actual pandemic hits, you're less likely to be prepared for it. I think the second thing that we can take away from the pandemic is that it clearly has huge impacts. It both kills lots and lots of people, and it has a huge cost, especially to our economy. We have to get this balance right. And we've struggled to have that conversation, and very often people just say, you shouldn't have it. But clearly, there's a cost to tackling uh, corona, and there's a cost to not tackling corona. We need to weigh those two up against each other. And once we're done with corona, I think we'll be looking back at this and having one of those moments where we realize, that's the same conversation we need on climate. Big problem, but the solutions also have big, big costs. Let's make sure that we actually balance the two. Yeah, that's uh, it's really it's really interesting to look at this because prioritization is really what you're talking about here. And if you don't prioritize the right things, and you're looking at global warming, and you go through all of all of the details uh, in the book, but you know, pandemic response is something that obviously can hit you and turn your entire world upside down overnight with no warning. That's not the type of problem that global warming is. No. Global warming is a slow, steady problem that we'll have to fix over the next, say, 80 years or so. Uh, and, and so I'm often astounded by how people will tell you this as if it hits tomorrow. Uh, you know, one, one great headline from climate change ran in Washington Post, many papers across the country and really around the world uh, last year, told us, 187 million people are going to have to move because of global warming or going to be flooded. And some even said are going to drown because sea levels will rise. Now, it's absolutely true. Global warming will make sea levels rise. But they assume that nobody will do anything the next 80 years. So, you know, you'll sit and the waves will start lapping up over your knees and then your hips and eventually you drown. No. Humans actually take action. And the same paper that said 187 million people will flood if we don't do anything also said if we do anything reasonable, we will see 305,000 people having to move by the end of the century. So 600 times less. And what that tells you is when you hear these very scary and alarmist stories on climate change, don't necessarily believe them. It's not that they're untrue, but it's that they leave out very crucial information that actually helps you make real world decisions. This is what you do an amazing job with in this book, which is essentially, I feel, feel like it's the origin story of all these claims you've heard. You, like like a, you know, a superhero origin story where you go back and look at how did this claim get to you? How did the claim of 187 million people get to me? And you break it down piece by piece and you do it in a way of, of you're not skeptical of their science at all. You're saying this is what the paper actually says. And it's such an effective way to look at this. Another one you look at in this same section is the idea that in 12 years, we are going to, uh, we're, the world's over. We only have 12 years to save the planet. We've heard everyone, every American politician has uh, said this that is on the left over and over again. What's the origin story of it? So this came from the Paris Climate Agreement, which we all entered into in 2015. Uh, there, a lot of ambitious politicians realized they, they can't actually promise very much because that's really costly and really hard. So instead, they make this sort of flourish general promise of saying, we're going to keep temperatures from rising above 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. That sounds like a very funny number, and that's because it's a nice number in centigrade. Mm -hmm. But fundamentally, they just made this nice promise 
Nobody actually believes you can do it. But what they then said is, ah, we promised this. How do we, how do we actually do that? So they asked the UN climate panel after they'd promised to say, could you please tell us how we can reach this almost unreachable target? And not surprisingly, the UN climate panel then came back and said, look, if you really want to reach this very, very impossible target, you have to do almost everything impossible. You have to change your entire economy in what was then 12 years, now by 2030. So that's how the 12 years arose. And now, of course, it's 10 years. If you want to do something almost impossible, you have to do almost impossible political stuff. But they weren't actually telling you that you should do that. <laughs> actually, it turns out to be an incredibly bad idea. It's a little bit like asking you know, NASA, so you know, what would it take for everyone on, in America to go to the moon? Well, they probably say, well, technically we can do this, but you'd have to divert all resources to NASA for the next 12 years, and it's going to be phenomenally costly, and you won't have food and all that other stuff, but then you can do it. Doesn't mean they're saying you should do it. Right. So to be clear, the UN IPCC never said we need to keep uh, uh, the temperature at 1.5 degrees centigrade. It's just a, a Paris Accord number, and they retrofitted some bizarre scenario to try to hit it. That's an, I mean, that's not been covered in the media at all. No. And that's, of course, because a lot of people of goodwill. So look, I've debated a lot of these people. They want to do good. Mm -hmm. They believe that the way to help the future of the planet is to dramatically cut temperatures. And there is some good to be done with that. But what they forget, of course, is that there are real costs to changing the engine of growth. Remember, what has made us rich over the last 200 years is basically the immense access to energy, most of it fossil fuels. Remember 200 years ago, most of us were incredibly renewable because we didn't have anything else. We used our own muscles, we had horses and other draft animals and a little bit of, of water mills that would actually uh, churn our, our, our wheat. That was about it. Fossil fuels made it possible for us to go from, you know, uh, in late 1800s, 70, sorry, 94% of all energy in U.S. Uh, industry came from humans. Today, that is about 7%. Mm. Because, of course, we can now actually use, you know, big tractors and, and uh, heavy movers and all these things that actually make us rich. So telling people, now you can't do that anymore is actually going to have a real cost. And of course, telling it to the poor people of the world who are trying to get on the first route of this, who actually want to get industrialized, is just simply terrible. They would like to get out of poverty first. Thank you. Yeah, yes, much more crucial. You know, your work over the years has really had me, um, uh, it makes me crazy to make sure I'm always applying a cost-benefit analysis. So often, uh, we just apply a benefit analysis. It's something we do all the time in politics. This would be great if we could have this. Well, sure, it would be great, but what does it cost? Um, one of the things yeah. you, you highlight in the book I thought was really interesting um, was talking about uh, a study about heat waves and how it's going to, you know, it's going to kill all these people because of heat. And there we only hear the cost, this terrible, terrible thing. But there's something on the other side that completely outweighs it, um, and in this study at all, as well, they talk about, again, a, a recurring theme in your book, how they apply this standard of absolutely no human adaptation, which makes absolutely no sense. Can you walk us through this one? Yes. So there's two big problems with this argument. One is that everyone will tell you, look, if we get more climate change, you're going to see more heat waves and hence more people dying from heat. That's true. But you're also going to get much fewer cold waves and hence more people not dying from cold. And what you have to remember is almost everywhere on the planet, even in India, many more people die from cold than heat. Actually, globally, we estimate that for every one person dying from heat, 17 people die from cold. Mm. And this is not my study. This is the Lancet, the world's leading medical journal, estimating that. So what we know is if you see temperatures rise and only look at the ad additional heat deaths, you're missing out on quite a bit. And it's actually very likely that within reasonable temperature increases, you're probably going to see them weighed out by fewer cold deaths. So yes, you'll have more heat deaths, but you'll have fewer cold deaths. But then the, the study that you were talking about, and, and this was also on the headlines in many papers around the US uh, last year, basically said, what will happen when temperatures keep rising 
what will happen with heat deaths? And they said, many, many thousands of people are going to die in these extraordinary heat waves, assuming nobody buys an air conditioner. <laughs> so they literally assumed that, you know, for instance, in Texas, almost everyone has uh, an air conditioner already. And so you will not see more deaths. Where they saw the deaths was up north. So for instance, Seattle, where only 38% of everyone has an air conditioner. So what they basically said was, if nobody in Seattle gets the bright idea to buy an air conditioner in the next 80 years, they're going to be in trouble. But of course, if they actually buy an air conditioner, and if they also become much richer, which the UN and everybody else believes they will be, and they will have much better technology, they will die a lot less. Now, Global warming is still a problem because they would have died even less without global warming. But to make even less into a big, big problem is just simply misrepresenting the conversation. Uh, yeah, I mean, you are so good at just being able to find, looking at the whole picture, it's just something the media refuses to do. And, you know, I, there's a lot of reasons for that. There's clickability, there's agenda. There's a lot of things I think that go into it. I, I you know, as a guy who does politics all the time in the United States, I am not a fan of the political reporting here, but the health and science reporting is actually worse, which is really saying something. Um, one of the things you talk about here uh, in the book, and the book is uh, is uh, called False Alarms, How Climate Change Panic Costs Us Trillions, Hurts the Poor, and Fails to Fix the Planet. Can't recommend it highly enough. Um, you talk about hurricanes. And uh, in, the, in the hurricane section, you talk about the expanding bullseye effect. Can you explain that? Yeah. So, you know, when you look around and people tell you, see, this was the most expensive hurricane ever. Oh, and here's an even more expensive hurricane ever. It's very often used as a way to say, See, global warming are making hurricanes much worse, and they're going to cost the U.S. much, much more. First of all, we're actually not seeing increasing number of hurricanes, not even of strong hurricanes. If you look at the landfalling hurricanes, which are the best recorded since 1900, they have actually slightly declined since 1900. And that's also true for the strongs of the category th three and above. So we're not actually seeing increasing number even of hurricanes or strong hurricanes. but we are seeing dramatically increasing damages from hurricanes. But that has almost nothing or nothing to do with global warming. It has everything to do with many more people living much closer to harm's way with much more stuff. So remember, back in, you know, back in 1900, almost nobody lived in Florida. The Florida coastal communities have actually increased 67-fold in population over the last 120 years. 67-fold. Whereas the U.S. has only quadrupled in population. So everyone has moved to coastal Florida. Mm -hmm. They also have much more costly homes. So, of course, when a hurricane hits now, it'll create a lot more damage than when it hit back in 1926, when actually the biggest hurricane tore right through downtown Miami. But there was almost nothing to tear through. That's why you haven't heard about it. It doesn't even have a name. It's just the 1926 Miami hurricane. But if that hurricane hit today, it would be by far the costliest hurricane ever to hit the U.S. Not because of global warming, but because many more people with much more stuff much closer to harm's way. And so again, this tells you, if you actually want to help people not being damaged by hurricanes and other things, well, get better building regulations and stop subsidizing insurance for people to just build irresponsibly, you know, places that'll keep being hit by hurricanes and also make better regulations. So some places people probably shouldn't be living. Thanks so much for tuning in on your Friday night. I know you put off all of your important plans just for me, and I appreciate that. A reminder that you can find links to all of tonight's full interviews in the description below as well. If you head to studosamerica.com, you can find all of our favorite platforms to watch our stupid episodes completely free. And if you dig the show, consider a piece of merch or two. We'd love that. Find everything we've got to offer at studosmerch.com. I'd like to once again thank Matt Ridley, uh, Michael Schellenberger, Bjorn Lomborg for being excellent people with an excellent message. Go pick up their books today. They're all great. We'll see you next week.